My name's Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfights.co.uk. In the first half of this two-part interview with illustrative artist Keith Linsell, who once again I'm linked up with here, we touched on the fact that an early professional association with well-known big fish enthusiast Trevor Housby proved to be something of a springboard for your work on the angling scene. This CV would ultimately include a vast range of iconic names from the 1960s through to the 1980s and beyond. People who, unlike today, didn't really need photographs to complement the writing and draw the reader in. The way these people wrote made you feel as though you were there on the bank, boat or beach fishing with them, and as such, few if any carried cameras back in those early days, hence your artistic support. And not surprisingly, that association would also require the added bonus of regular angling outings with some of them, resulting in you getting to know many of them at a level which the rest of us never could. So to take advantage of that fact, and for the sake of historical record, perhaps you could share with us what you can recall about each of these people, starting with the one I mentioned a few moments ago, the big man, Trevor Housby. Uh, a very good friend of mine, Victor Shearman, used to work on the fish and tackle and guns counter at Gamages at uh, Hoban in the City of London. Um, he saw all sorts of people coming in to buy fishing tackle there and various items of clothing for the same job. And one of his regular customers was Trevor Housby, who at that time lived in his mother's house, although he was born in Cornwall and worked in Cornwall before he came up to London, in Doughty Street, which is just north of Hoban. And they were always chatting about fish and fishing, etc., etc. And Trevor had the intro to a carp syndicate water down in Kent near Seven Oaks. And he asked Victor if he'd like to become a member. And Victor said, yes, of course. He said, can I include a very good friend of mine, Keith? He's an angler and he likes drawing fishes, etc., etc. And Trevor said, yes, of course. Cut a long story short, we both became members of what was known then as Sundridge Lakes. At a later date, Geoffrey Bucknell ran those waters, and they were a, a trout fishery at that time. And when Jeff joined up with several good friends of his and made a partnership to sell tackle, the name they chose for what became the largest British tackle manufacturer in the country was Sundridge Fishing Tackle. And that's where that particular firm got its name from. Those were the lakes just outside a small village called Sundridge near Seven Oaks in Kent. Right, to continue with Trevor Housby, later on in years to come, Trevor apparently, from various other people who were writing about him, we are told that he had a bit of a temper, and that sometimes he could be quite nasty, etc., etc. But all the times that I'd been with Trevor, he, he just struck me as being a very nice, pleasant person. He liked a bit of a tale, a bit of a story. As far as I knew, he hardly drank, and he was a very pleasant, jovial person and hard worker. Another influence on your career, I believe, was Michael Pritchard. Michael Pritchard, he didn't live very far from me. He lived in Upminster. He was art editor of Creole magazine in London. I think Bernard Venables had just left as the editor and I think John Nixon at the time took over as editor, and Michael Pritchard was the art editor. Just prior to John Nixon, there was another chap who'd bought the magazine, but who made a bit of a pig's ear of it. The chap's name escapes me at the moment, but very quickly I think it ran into financial trouble, and John Nixon was brought in as editor, and Michael Pritchard had been the art editor prior to John Nixon's editorship, and he was still art editor when Nixon was in the chair. John Nixon, of course, well known as a carp angler, uh, one of the baggy corduroy and plaid shirt brigade, as we all eventually turned into, apart from those who, who wished to show off too much on the riverbank. And I think he contacted me, or I may have contacted them. Now, Michael lived quite close to me in Upminster, and that meant he could pop round to my place uh, initially in Ilford, where I lived in upstairs flat in a, in a terrace house with uh, my wife, and just discuss various jobs. I'd submitted initially work to him, and it took off from there. Michael eventually became the man in charge of the relaunch of Fishing Tackle with Woolworths, W.H. Woolworths Company, 
and I think they gave him sort of an open check to advise them on exactly what sort of tackle they should and would be selling in the future. And he was the chap who organised everything. The rods, the reels, everything. Mind you, he was on a little bit of a budget and a lot of the tackle was cheap but of fairly good quality. In fact, years beforehand, Woolworths was known, along with a few other similar stores, to sell material only from Japan. And it was really cheap rubbish because I don't think the Japanese knew what they were doing when it came to the British market and most of the buyers including then from Woolworths didn't know about fishing tackle so you had two wrongs which never ended up making a right they were forever chasing their tail and scratching their heads and wondering why the stuff didn't sell in the stores and the reason was it it simply wasn't applicable the style of rods etc etc to the general run of fishing that we do in this country both freshwater fly and sea but uh, michael reorganized all of that in uh, round about 1971 i think was the launch 70 or 70 i, I think 71 and that put a whole different stamp on things and i illustrated the book gone fishing with michael and th that was a general how to do book introduction to angling and that sold two editions over a good number of years what about fred buller whose doomsday book of mammoth pie jacket you painted Ah, Fred Buller, I only knew by repute because while I was working in the fishing and guns trade, his name cropped up, of course, because I think at the time he was the chairman of the Gunmakers Association. Prior to doing the cover for the Big Pike book, my illustration appeared on the cover of one of his books, Fred Buller's Book of Rigs and Tackle. I did the perch that was on the front cover of that. That was the second printing of that particular fish. I'd earlier had it used as the front cover of Creel magazine, and Fred Buller's book, Rigs and Tackle, was published in 1967. Later on in 1979, I was lucky enough to be approached by Hutchinson, the, the, the publishers, then known as Stanley Paul, to do a front cover for a chap who had written a rather big book on pike fishing. And when I went up to their offices in London, I was shown a rough manuscript and told was that the author was Fred Buller and that the book title was Doomsday Book of Mammoth Pike. And could I do a coloured rough to start with for the design of, of the wrap round book jacket for that title? And I, you know, I readily agreed and, and I discussed in detail what was required with the art editor who, by the way, actually said to me, he said, right, we've got this picture of this big pike and we want it doing this and doing that, but I think we'll have a Coke can in the mud at the bottom of the lake. And I, 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 <laughs> my brains went to mush as I tried to figure out why I have a Coke can when uh, I already described to him that I would try to portray a pike, say a Loch Lomond pike, and possibly there weren't many Coke cans in Loch Lomond. So anyway, we ended up with a damn great pike, and if you ever see a copy of the book and you open it out flat, the pike, by its girth and its other dimensions, would weigh, well, £60 plus perhaps. I did it, and I suggested that it had a, a rather nice brown trout in its jaws to match up with a then very fashionable Loch Lomond. And that was quite successful. Very, very lucky on my part, because that particular book has become a classic angling book, and uh, Fred Buller's name is up there in lights with the rest of them. And again, an, another lucky trip over for myself to get that sort of job. I was paid in 1979 the princely sum of £250 for that cover, or the printing rights for that anyway, which, I don't know, m might have been a good payment for then. I'm thinking back in 1979, yes. Next up is a man I was also fortunate to fish with, and towards the end of his life record an audio interview with, the legendary Clive Gammon. OK, let me think Clive Gammon. Right, during my association with Angling Magazine, Clive Gammon was a regular contributor. That would be back in the mid to late 60s. And Clive Gammon's name was always mentioned. Um, he was the man. He contributed to several other magazines at the same time. And again, I was lucky enough to do the illustrations for the Hamlin Colour Guide for Clive Gammon's book, Sea Fishing. 
In 1968, I was approached by a chap called Peter Mortar, who ran what was known as the Design Bureau. That is, he and a group of uh, other artists and designers were contracted out by large publishers to design and lay out various series of books. And in in this uh, instance, it was the Hamlin Colour Guides, a series of paperback colour guides on all sorts of subjects, including angling. Now, he contacted me after the Hamlin publishers put me on to him, and I went for an initial meeting at his place in Barnet in North London, and he offered me not only the illustrative work on Clive Gammon's book, Sea Angling, in that particular series, but also an extra fee if I could amass all the references required for that book for other of the artists and designers uh, to do apart from myself. He also offered me work on various other titles like Garden Flowers and Shrubs and that sort of thing. And the total amount on offer, and this was 1968, was between three and four hundred pounds. And it was at that time I, I took the decision, after consulting my dear wife of two years, to go completely freelance. I'd been working since 1953 on a freelance basis, but had been PAYE employed during the day. But in 1968, when I had this offer from Peter Mortar for that amount of money, I then decided to go self-employed. And three or four hundred pounds in 1968 was a reasonable amount of money. It would count as a good float on which to either survive or die on. And that's when I took the plunge. So that was first semi-contact, as it were, literary, with Clive Cameron. And later on, of course, as I say, he was well known in the angling press, but I never actually met him then. The first time I met him was when the Osprey Anglers series, Osprey the publisher of mostly military at that time, and very excellent stuff too, Osprey contacted me and uh, said we've got this chap called Clive Gammon, or rather, first of all, they invited me uptown to their offices for an initial meeting with them to see if my work was good enough. And when they okayed it, they then told me that Clive Gammon, who at the time, I think, was writing the angling section on the sports page of the Sunday Times, that Clive Gammon would be the general editor, and indeed author of one or two of the titles, of the Osprey Angler series. That was the first time I met him. I, I, I met him at a hotel up in London, and we discussed the layout of the series of books in detail, and we went on from there, and later, you know, contacted by phone, letter, etc., I then had contact with all of the various authors of the 16 titles, which widened my area of knowledge of people such as uh, Peter Stone, although briefly, but you get to know people with several chats on the phone and several letters back and forth, with them supplying various references, and it was all very enjoyable. And, of course, the Osprey Anglers series had become a collector's item. Clive Gammon was writing the angling column on the sports pages of the Sunday Times, and he then contacted me, obviously due to the Osprey contact, and asked me if I would like to do some illustrations, line work, detail, for his fishing column in the Sunday Times. I thought, my God, this is great. So again, I had to go up to London, Gray's Inn Road, where the Sunday Times was situated at the time, and meet with their art editor and show him my work. He was very satisfied with the material, And he said, right, he said, I'll leave it up to you and Clive to produce the piece of work, and as long as we get it by the deadline, that's fine. We don't pay rubbish money, and um, let's look forward to a good future together. And that was it. Then we went on for some months, I think, and then Clive had to become the... Sorry, he didn't have to. I think he was invited to be the roving reporter. What, What was that? Sports Illustrated. That's it. He was the roving angler for Sports Illustrated. He he was their itinerant roaming angler for Sports Illustrated magazine in the States. So he sort of ditched the Sunday Times column in common with a number of other stuff, I suppose, which anchored him to England, and off he went. His place was taken by Brian Clark. So what was Clive like then as a person? I found him genial but I understand that he had later on uh, health problems. I don't know how much you'd like me to, to say, Phil. Whatever you wish, just as long as it's historically accurate. 
with freelance people anyone who's freelance has to have an understanding wife if they're married or at least those nearest and dearest to them have to put up with the three car trick continually time after time after time if you're like myself for example you work in your own home that's fair enough the stress is um you can just about handle sometimes because uh, the, your other half always needs to go out and have a, a relaxing time, etc., etc., whereas you're concentrating on keeping your nose to the grindstone and, and uh, earning money uh, in, in order to keep the family together. But if you are a travelling freelance, if you are a writer that needs to be the other side of the country or, in Gammon's case occasionally, the other side of the world in order to, to get reference for your articles and your fame is getting wider and wider and therefore the pay packet is getting larger and larger, those pressures on you to keep on producing good work sometimes, and I've known this on several occasions, leads to the destruction of the family because nature is a strange way of pairing up men in various places with women who are not their wives, and everything starts to deteriorate. And I think dear old Clive drunk a little bit towards the end, and I would put that down to the pressures of absolute chaos in his life. But a great writer, great man, a good champion of angling and common sense, and perhaps the latter is more important than the first. Earlier, you mentioned Brian Clark. So what can you tell us about him? Brian Clark. Now, a very gentle but stern, a very studious character, very nice man, very detailed again. Almost everyone I know, perhaps including myself, were full of absolute detail. You'd never get a shorthand answer because, as most people know, quick answers do not give the summation of a particular situation or of the solving of a particular problem. So Brian Clark took over the angling column in the Sunday Times and he then contacted me, introduced himself and we went away from there and he would phone through what we needed. I would then contact the Sunday Times and ask them what sort of size and shape to fit a particular text block they required in the illustrations and I would give them a rough layout of what I would be doing. Brian Clark would contact me on a Wednesday, generally speaking, with his ideas about what he was going to write and the sort of illustrations he would want for that particular piece. I would then phone the Sunday Times and speak to their art editor and ask him what type of shape he would want the illustration to fit into if they'd got to that layout stage at that time. Further on on the Wednesday I would then start to tackle the layout and work most of the Wednesday remaining and the Thursday finishing the rough and then tracing it down and then inking it in in detail and quite often on the Thursday I would be working into the early hours of Friday mornings out to four o'clock in the morning before it was finished because my dread would be to go to bed completely knocked out with tiredness knowing that I would have to wake up fairly early in the morning to finish the job off. My way of things was always to finish the job off first and then collapse into bed so that on the Friday morning I would just need to put a cover on the job, pack it up, take it to my local railway station, put it on Red Star phone the Sunday Times and they would pick it up at the other end. That's the same pattern I had used with Clive Gammon. Although not, not very good for your social life, that's the sort of thing that I had to do quite regularly anyway in my other jobs. Brian Harris and his magazine connections were, I know, very important to your career. Brian Harris, let me see. Back in the early days in the 1960s, Kenneth Mansfield used to be the editor of Angling Magazine. I was very young then. I remember feeling my way and being blown over by these names from my bookshelves and to be in front of the desk and behind it was sat Kenneth Mansfield. It was something, you know, when, when they talk about the history of the BBC and you have all these recordings of people that you vaguely heard about on the radio as you were growing up, when you were five or six or ten years old. These legends. So it was with Ken Mansfield. Ken Mansfield was one of those ghostly 
echoing heroes uh, of rather heavyweight, apparently to my tiny mind at that stage, angling, but uh, he, he appeared to be everywhere, quite decent, very good author, he knew his stuff. Uh, there I would be, trying to sell him my piddly little line drawings for his, his magazine. This would be in the mid-60s, 1967, 1966 perhaps. And yes, he accepted, he started to accept for his magazine line drawings by myself. And a little later on, when they changed editors, I introduced myself to the new editor, Brian Harris. He was a much younger man, of course, in his mid-thirties. And uh, we got on like a house on fire. We both liked a small drink and a long chat. He was very efficient. He had started off, I think, with the Kent Messenger, his local paper down in Kent as a cub reporter, and uh, worked his way up, as it were. He then started taking my work. We worked on several new ideas, like uh, Life in the Water, which I did under a pseudonym of Al James, which was quite a legitimate pseudonym, as my middle names are Alfred James. But Al James swung a little bit more than Alfred James. And it was at that stage when I started doing black and white tone drawings in wash and line as part of my stock in trade as illustrations. At that time, they couldn't print artwork in colour very well, so I did quite a few illustrations in tones of grey, as it were, and they proved quite interesting. It certainly extended my expertise a little bit after extending my own talent, my own personal talent, in trying to get the effects that I required. And there again, it's another little step from line work to those tone paintings that I used to do to illustrate in Anglia magazine. Uh, oh, sorry, Brian Harris. OK. I illustrated, or I supplied illustrations. I illustrated one book, the Corgi Book of Fishing, that he did, which unfortunately was a, a, a quite a small tome. I then supplied him with various photographs and I think some line work for a couple of books he did with Guinness Superlatives, as they were called, their book section at the time. Let me see, what else was that? Yes, I, I fished with him several times. Well, more than several times, in fact, because I used to be invited along on their fishing trips that they then used to do the write-up from and of, as it were, whether it be bass fishing or... I did everywhere except Ireland. Local trips to course fishing around London, the, the south of England, etc., etc., fishing the south coast... I invited him a couple of times to fish with me, both fresh water and uh, up at Shingle Street, I think, in Suffolk, the steep two beaches from the from the shore. And uh, he also came out on the boat and boats that we were using out from Bradwell in 1973 and 1974 on our fishing trips, opening up the sea fishing in the Blackwater Estuary. Brian now, after 30 years, I contacted him a few years back and he still has colour in his hair, for goodness sake. He makes fishing rods to order, which are in quality near to the Hardy Brothers quality rods. He takes his time, he's an excellently skilled man. He also still, at his age, which I think is approaching 80, he also goes deer stalking. And if you ask him how he did, if you question his accuracy with a rifle, he gets rather upset. So I take it, as with all other stuff I experienced him doing, I take it that he's a bit of a crack shot. What are your recollections of the father of distance casting, Les Moncrief? Les Moncrief, I met fleetingly once or twice, but again, there was one of those uh, legendary names... He worked a lot for Angling Times. Sometimes I just missed him when I went into the office to discuss work that they required from me. Uh, at, oh, yes, he did. He came down to one of the Angling Club dues. Sorry, I belong to a club. And one of their social evenings, they had invited Les Moncrief down. Yes, so therefore I can say I, I spent an evening with him, and as I'm saying that, I remember a trip to Reculver in Kent, Reculver Towers, where uh, several other angling luminaries... <laughs> I was invited along on these fishing trips with Angling Magazine to take the photographs. Now, whether that means that none of the other gang 
has either the use or the ability to use a camera, I don't know. I think the fact that I had submitted photographs for publication to the magazine may have led them astray once or twice. And the fact that I could say um, the word Pentax must have impressed them somewhat. Among that group down at Recolver Towers was Leslie Moncrief, who I must say was fishing at the other end of the line of anglers who were fishing for Thornback Ray in general, or anything else that appeared in those shallow waters so much like the waters we have around in Essex. He was on the end of the line, so I can't say that I actually fished with Moncrief, because I was about 150 yards away from him. But I certainly watched him cast, and very impressive he was. But Moncrief, again, would have weighed in at least 18 stone, I would have thought. He was about 6 foot 2, very gentle man, very quietly spoken. But when he told the, the sea angling world that it was easy to cast 100 yards... There's not one person in 50 sea anglers I would gamble, and that would include perhaps some beach anglers, who knew what 100 yards would be. So dear old Leslie Moncrief may have been casting 100 yards most of the time, but he had the build to apparently cast effortless... My God. To cast effortless... No, it won't... <laughs> effortlessly into the middle distance because of his bulk and his obvious power which wasn't an obvious thing when you looked at the man he looked quite a shambling man he wasn't a large bouncy muscle bound sort of chap but obviously he would have this power for the layback casting style that uh, he had introduced and developed Ian Gillespie Gillespie Dear old Ian Gillespie, a very nice man, the sort of man that you would say, who would I like to spend a quiet evening chatting and having a laugh with? Ian would be at the top of the list. Again, he was outgoing, robust, humorous. He taught English at a school in Ipswich in Suffolk, and he was a countryman who was a teacher. He should have been out in the fields and the woods. He should have been tramping the beaches. He should have been hanging over the edge of various boats at sea, fishing for all sorts of things. But he had to earn money, so his day job, he was an English teacher. He had a partial interest in the breakaway tackle firm. Uh, his partner's name escapes me for the moment. Nigel Forrest. Nigel Forrest, that's right. He had an interest uh, with Nigel Forrest and between them they had developed a breakaway fishing lead to initially fish from the shore because the tides up there where they were they are what was known as lateral tides they go in and out but they do not go in and out if you were standing on the beach they would not recede and come in at you they would recede to your right and they would proceed from your right after the change of tide that is, they came in sideways across and alongside the shore and that meant that up until that time, any beach angler would have to use a very heavy lead in order to hold bottom on those strong lateral tides, particularly places like Shingle Street where you have steep two beaches and the tide run, even a few yards out, is tremendous. So as history had developed, anglers from the beach under those conditions were using heavy leads and therefore that meant a heavy rod to cast those heavy leads, and in turn that led to using line that had to be of a certain breaking strain. Heavy line, heavy lead, heavy rod. And the beach angler, generally speaking, had no way of getting out from that if he was to, to fish and succeed and hook fish under those circumstances. Now what the breakaway lead did, the traditional lead had four spikes on it which were firmly fixed and sometimes you would adjust them a little in order to hold better on the type of bottom that you were fishing on, but mostly you couldn't. That lead would sometimes turn, and it would roll and tumble, or the spikes would pick up stray seaweed, and it would give you an indication of a bite, and you, you didn't have one, and you'd end up at various times of the year, and at various tides, you would end up reeling in pounds and pounds of seaweed caught on the spikes of your lead, now, the breakaway lead had spikes, but they literally were sprung. The wires were loose. You could hang them down, and they, they would swing at the bottom of the lead, and when you clipped them 
in the up position, the wires sticking out would imitate the old-fashioned spikes on the old lead weights. These were substantial stainless steel wires, but they were a lot lighter, and they were held in position below with red beads clicked into four indentations in the side of the torpedo-shaped lead, and it enabled the angler, due to the way the leads worked, to fish a lighter lead, a lighter breaking strain line, and therefore the development of lighter and far more sporting and enjoyable to use beach rods. And what would happen was you would cast up tide, you would let out a load of slack, you would let the tide take a loop of line between you and the lead, and after the initial amount of line that you had let out, that would give the lead time to drop down to the bottom without any any other pressure from the shore on it, turn itself round the way it wanted to go, and hook itself in the bed, and you would slowly reel in until you had a loose loop of line from your rod tip, and you would put your rod on the rod rest, and you would watch this slight loop, and as long as you had that slight loop, you knew that your lead was holding fast where you wanted it to be, and by indication would come about when a cod or a whiting would pick up your bait, normally on a snood, take the bait, hook itself, and then in its initial struggle it would release the collapsible legs on the lead weight and that the lead weight would then flow with the tide and the pull of the fish. Then your line would start to straighten and your rod tip would start to thump and that would be the indication you would have that that a fish had taken your bait with the breakaway lead. And that innovation, well, it was not only a shot in the arm for the tackle trade, it was a shot in the arm for any angler who wanted to fish lightly with a bait for bass or any other species in, at that time, shallow water. But latterly, the uptide method was then used on anchored boats in fairly shallow water, but it's also been used in moderate depths. As long as you could get as far uptide as you could to allow enough line, slack line, for the lead to drop down and hit bottom before it pounded too far across to your left or to your right. So, yes, getting back to dear old Ian, he and Nigel Forrest had developed this lead and they had this firm called Breakaway Tackle. And the world and his wife was buying them and the world and his wife, including me, was surreptitiously buying um, lead moulds and making their own, as I'd been doing for years anyway, but uh, the Breakaway was rather attractive to do. First class angler, short fellow, only about my height, about five foot seven. We fished Fairlight Cove for bass with the angling magazine mob. Uh, We fished several other places. I went with him and Bob Cox and one other chap on various jaunts that we had to do. That We did the Highland and Islands. We went to the Outer Hebrides. There was uh, Gillespie, Bob Cox, myself and, and another chap. And we also fished i think yes he was with us on the channel islands that's right channel islands a little job we had to do and a very good company fabulous on both of these trips that i've just mentioned we worked our socks off we were getting freebies we were getting the trip paid for us yes but we weren't sitting around in the sun we were doing four trips sometimes up to four trips per day to various parts of various places that we were stationed at. And uh, it was rather wearing, but very, very enjoyable, sometimes dangerous because we didn't know the ground, we didn't know the shore, we didn't know the cliffs. Um, Yes, Ian Gillespie was there, and he was a regular on the boats in our company with Bob Cox, John Raw, myself, on the sea fishing boat trips out from Bradwell on sea into the estuary and further. And the poor man died a few years after this particular period from a heart attack. What can you tell us about Aussie character Digger Derrington? First of all, I saw one or two of his articles in Angling Magazine and various other places, and I came across him. I met him once, I think, when I went up to Angling Magazine, and he was there as well. We shook hands, we had a chat, and I discovered that he lived at that time a short distance away from where I lived in uh, Ilford. He lived at Newbury Park, which was the, as it were, the next section of town going east. Occasionally he would have little get-togethers of anglers and he would have a little chat and we would have a few drinks 
and his wife would make the steeled sandwich and we'd drink beer and we'd have a nice time. But I was starting to be told by some of the staff and dear old Brian Harris at the magazine, not to mention the Japanese, because Dicker had had a very unfortunate war inasmuch as he was in the Royal Australian Army stationed at Singapore when the Japanese walked in and because our guns, well you know the story, because our guns were facing the wrong way everything went down the Swanee and he ended up in Changi Prison building the, the Burmese Railway etc 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 and he saw a lot of his mates die under nasty circumstances he himself nearly died so therefore he couldn't stand to be in the presence of either Japanese or Chinese uh, later, he had volunteered for the Korean War. He was a bit of a lad. He was by no means a soft person, and this led him to a certain amount of trouble. Anyway, during his Korean stint, he was caught along with others in an ambush at one particular time, and uh, a machine gun fire from various angles cut all the straps on his big pack and various other parts of his anatomy and just cut all the straps, but he wasn't even nicked by the bullets that did it, which always amazed me, but he spun round at the time, went under severe fire from ambush, and uh, yeah, that's what happened, he cut all the webbing belts, and away went his big pack on, on his back. Now, you may have got part of the flavour of the man, he was quiet and nice at home. He used to cuddle his Daxon dogs, and his wife was nice and quiet, but... He was always five seconds from a flare-up. Uh, there were a legion of stories whereby he, he'd been at certain functions or he may have been in a hotel lobby, etc., etc. And he would meet accidentally a Japanese and have a few words and before long he would be threatening to kill them or cut their throats. Oh yes, Digger had a stammer and nobody thought anything about it. We were quite friendly, and he drove me home once from Fairlight Cove, after sea fishing from the cliffs down there. And as we were chatting, I said, uh, as a matter of fact, something like, does your stammer disappear if you sing or whistle? It was quite a straightforward question from my point of view. It wasn't meant to be insulting or, or humorous or anything like that. I wouldn't do that sort of thing. Anyway, he stopped his Anglia car, at the side of the road, started giving me a, a load of foul language and calling me all sorts of sons of bitches and all that stuff, and threatening to take my face off and all that. And we stood there, and he, he, he kept on going for a, a, well, it felt like minutes, but maybe a, a minute. And I just sort of looked at him in a rather doubtful and condemning and pitiful sort of way, and then he stopped. He said, right, he said, you bastard, get back in the car, I'll drive you home, and that's it. I won't talk to you again. So that's what happened. That would be round about 1968. But, unfortunately, in 1969, my father died. And while I was on a trip, actually, I was staying with Brian Harris, bass fishing, and he drove my wife and I to the station. We were both down there with him and his wife. He drove us to the station, and at 5.30, I said to Jan, I wonder how my father is. He had been ill for some time, up and down. And it was only when we arrived home that I discovered from my brother that he died at 5.30 while we were in the car, at the same time as I mentioned it. Anyway, after the death of my father, who was only 49, Digger heard of this and he wrote me a nice conciliatory letter, you know, saying it's stupid not to talk and all this business and making mountains out of molehills and let's get back together again. I'm, I'm having another meeting here at my home. You know, you're, you're cordially invited. Please do so, blah, 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 which I did. I think Brian was uh, invited, as, as well as one or two other names. But Digger had the habit, which I dislike intently, of putting his arm round you while he's talking to you. Now, I dislike that intently. I never do that to anybody, and it's a little bit intimidating. And I think he meant that as an intimidatory action, although with a smile on his face. On another occasion, because we used to fish together with the angling magazine mob, I always used fixed ball reels, and I still do to this day. I find them, for my purposes, easier to use than multipliers, and that's it, that's what I use. So therefore, with all these experts, I'm surrounded by experts on the shore from Angling Magazine, all using top-of-the-range multipliers and all casting like dreams, occasionally 
a lot of foul language would come from a hundred yards away when a bird nest occurs, but I stuck to my mangle, as they called it. So it came to such a pass, Digger bet me that he could outcast me any time with my fixed ball reel by his multiplier. So we arranged to meet up on the football pitches at uh, Wanstead Flats between Forest Gate and Manor Park, East London, and see who was the better. I turned up, I believe, with a cut-down bass rod. I'd shortened the handle, but it had a good enough action. Digger turned up with his favourite beach casting rod. Uh, we both, I think, used three-ounce leads. It may have been four-ounce, I don't know, for the purposes of this rather short competition. And we, we decided to have three casts each, one after the other. So I cast first and achieved a 102 good paces that would be uh, yards in old-fashioned language and digger then cast and he got 95 big paces digger then cast first then myself digger won that one by 98 yards or paces to my 94 i then made my third cast and it beat digger by around 98 yards to his 89 he then made some excuse about there being uh, no more time for more casts because it was Sunday and he had a lot to do. But I could see that when he wasn't talking, he was grinding his teeth. Now, Digger was a good angler, but maybe on this occasion I'd been more careful to punch my rod up as near as I could to 45 degrees. And I think that my rod was lighter than his with quick recovery. And I knew that I could really lean into that rod for a long cast. Anyway, Digger lost. His swagger was less, and we went home. On meeting again with Brian Harris a couple of years ago, and over the phone we discussed Digger, and apparently he'd gone back to Australia. There'd always been a question about whether they were going to let him back into Oz. Now, whether this was a joke, I don't know, but I suspect he may have had trouble with various Japanese encounters at the time and he may have been on a police record somewhere in this country and that may have initiated a sort of a blockage for a period of time with his own country and they may not have let him in until he was too old to cause any more damage. Anyway, he went back to Australia and Brian had told me that he died. What, well, if any, are your recollections of Dick Walker? Well, yes... Dick Walker, of course, I learned about. He was, uh, again, that overworked word, legend. And that only means some poor bugger who works his guts out, thought a little bit more than the person next door, and developed various ideas that, with a lot more hard work, succeeded. Dick was obviously special. He was born into, as I get the impression, a rather well-off family. He was trained as an engineer. He knew what he was talking about. And you couple that with the general knowledge required to be an all-round angler. That is, knowing tensile strengths, knowing rod pressures on lines and breaking strains and all the rest of it. And if you're going to be a half-decent angler, you have to understand all of those tiny subtleties and it becomes such a way of life that you can't even list what is going through your mind because you do them so automatically. And, of course, he was special. And he started to catch big carp at a time when big carp were unheard of. If anybody had ever caught a ten-pounder in their life, they were the praise of their village or town or, or angling club. Yes, I used to read, of course, Richard Walker's articles in Angling Times. I first knew about him or became aware of him in the late 50s when No Need to Lie, I think, was published and dropped me a line with Morris Ingham. And all of those books, I, I collected those steadily, as I was a carp angler at the time. No big fish, but I used to fish for carp continually, and they still fascinate me above any other species. Yes, so therefore, I bought a Mark IV carp rod, obviously uh, the basic one designed by uh, Richard Walker. I bought Mark IV Ravens, again, basically, the lesser rod of the two, designed by Richard Walker. I never bought the, what was the more powerful one, the pike fishing one. It was a huge thing. We sold such things in peaks, and I, you'd put them together and you'd wave it about, and it was like nothing on earth to me. It had no life. It had strength. But there was a mammoth version of the Mark IV carp rod designed for pike fishing and, to quote, 
casting out dead baits for pike and you can imagine that was a little bit of a loss i think um I, I suppose a lot of anglers in the past would have sworn by them but to my mind not quite hitting many of the marks needed in a fishing rod again perhaps i'm way off beam but that's the way they always appeared to me at the time I met Richard Walker first of all at an angling do. He came marching down the aisle with a small entourage and he looked at the uh, the drawings and prints that I was selling of my own at the time. Uh, we had a few brief words, a handshake, uh, and, and that was it. And then I replied to an article of his where he was, I forget the exact details, but he stated rather doggedly that the history of the bow and arrow... I think he was talking about casting or something, and then it ended up going back years on the theory of a bent stick and a string, and and it got on to archery and bows and arrows, and he, he stated categorically, and rather doggedly to my mind, that the history of the bow only went back to a given period. I forget what the period was, 300,000 years or something like that. Anyway, I wrote him a letter pointing out that that is how far it goes back at the moment. Archaeology could only point to that sort of age. And, of course, he would be right in saying that, but archaeology always has a trick up its sleeve, causing you to rewrite literally the, the prehistory books because of new discoveries. And it was my point was that because the bow and arrow is so basic, I could easily imagine that it having been invented and developed a little bit before then. So he, he then wrote a stinking reply in one of his articles, and that was that. At a later date, Timothy Benn, one of the directors of Ernest Benn Publishing, contacted me and said uh, Richard Walker was writing a book about his experiences, and it was intended to um, be in strip cartoon form, and would I be interested in doing the artwork? Of course, I sort of jumped rather slowly, but internally very fast at the job, and said, yes, please, I am interested. Then Dick Walker and I had a series of phone calls, a series of letters exchanged hands. He wrote to me, giving me reference for how he designed his bite indicator, his initial one, made from a two-ounce nut-brown tobacco tin and using what were known then as GPO relays. And these consisted of a pair of springs and some soldered contact, one on each, which, when a wire made contact the current was then passed to an external buzzer and uh, it meant that the line was running out through your rod rings at night you couldn't see it but you could hear the hiss if you were awake and then you could strike into a fish and that was later developed into the heron bite indicator which was quite a nice piece of commercialization housed in a streamlined plastic and that was a boon to anglers because for the first time you had a separate buzzer box which rested at the base of your furthest rod rest Obviously, we used two rod rests, one for near the reel and the other one a little further distant from the butt ring. And the line was just looped around an antennae from the bite indicator as the line took off from a taking fish with your bail arm open. That would then make the connection inside the bite indicator. A light would light up on the buzzer box. The buzzer would wake you from your dreams and you would get up, and if you didn't fall in the water, you had the presence of mind to wind the reel to close the bail arm and up with the rod, and hopefully you would have hooked your fish. So Walker was uh, it enabled lots of lunatics and people who shouldn't have been allowed on a bank to catch fish, because you could have no mind at all and use that equipment, and he was accused of doing that, which he repelled and said, well, you know, they will, quite justifiably, there will always be stupid anglers, as there are stupid policemen, milkmen, call it what you like. And he was dead right. It's not his fault that the useless people uh, employed useful things for a useless purpose. Getting back to the book. Fabulously interesting. We got to the stage where I, and I've still got all the bits of artwork and the roughs, where I'd done a strip version of the capture of his record 44-pound carp, initially called ravioli, but later, particularly by pressure from the press, called Clarissa. And even when he wrote articles calling it ravioli, they changed it to Clarissa. So he, he was sort of screaming mad, but stuck with the name. 
Uh, Clarissa was perhaps more pictorial name because it, it was housed later in the London Zoo Aquarium and Ravioli probably was a bit early to use such a name in the context of being overrun by foreigners, etc., etc., where Clarissa was a kinder, possibly non-English, I'm not quite sure, but a kinder name and an easier commercial name. Unfortunately, the book proposed with Richard Walker hit the buffer somewhere. Whether the publishers had changed their mind about having a book like that on their list, I know there was a lot of rearranging in publishing generally at that time, and maybe it was a victim of... Uh, a takeover or partial takeover or cutting back on costings anyway but the book unfortunately it didn't come to fruition and I think that was the last contact I had with Dick Walker he died well round about eight or ten years later now here's a person I know very little about Bill Keel I met Bill first of all when I was working up to uh, Peaks of Grey's Inn Road the tackle shop that would be round about 1966. And he was just a nice chap who popped in to buy tackle. He was a well-known angling writer on uh, ferox trout. That's the big wild lake trout of Ireland. The heavily spotted cannibal fish. And of course carp, the red spinners carp water at uh, Chesson in Hertfordshire where he was based. And of course several other large carp waters and syndicates that he fished at the time and, and wrote about. Um, I found him very amiable, very nice chap, and um, we ended up doing, I think, two books together. Maybe one book. Yes, it was the Clipper book of uh, fishing facts. It wasn't a high-flying book for a first book by such a knowledgeable chap, but I think maybe the publisher had taken note of his writings and uh, nobbled him and said, well, why don't you do a, a sort of a general how-to book and a, a general knowledge book? I illustrated that with, um, I think, colour and black and white at the time. And I think it sold fairly well. But uh, a very nice chap. I, I was also a guest of his at the, the Red Spinner's Carp Water. But nothing really came of it. It was a lousy day. A lot of big names were there fishing in our group. And uh, I don't think any of us caught very much, unfortunately. The, the poor man was sadly killed a few years later driving on a fishing trip they had a puncture or something they stopped at the side of the road i think it was a, a night time and uh, bill got out to help and he was hit by a lorry which went by and uh, very sad set up yeah i remember reading that in the angling press very sad so we've looked in some detail at the personalities behind some of the big names of yesteryear but what about standout memories of any specific trips and did these people always live up to the billing generated for them? There was um, one particular trip I did with uh, Tim Berry, who was the skipper, out from, I believe, Ramsgate, with Len Cut, Harvey Torbett, and a couple of other well-known anglers, sea anglers, and myself. I, of course, was the baby of the pack, and I'm, I'm always about 14 years at least or 20 years in some cases younger than the company I, I've, I've been invited to fish with. So we went out from Ramsgate after all sorts of fish, I think. We had a few fish, but it, it wasn't very successful. And it was a, a wee bit lumpy out there, and uh, we were being slung around a wee bit with the waves. And all of these seasoned anglers around me started to collapse one by one with uh, mal de mer, the old seasickness. They'd brought up their breakfast and I think uh, yesterday's dinner by the end of a, a couple of hours and they were laying there in grey befuddled masses in the bottom of the boat. And there was myself riding the waves and uh, watching the rod tip and tentatively inquiring as to their health during most of the day and feeling rather superior that I, as a, as a complete beginner, or not, not a complete beginner, but far less experienced than them, had literally weathered this particular storm and at the end of the day, as we went back through the greyness and the rain, the weather cleared and warm sun broke out. And as we approached the harbour walls at Ramsgate, they were fine and chatting and drinking coffee, and I was hung over the side in front of thousands of holiday makers and their children, being as sick as a dog, which sort of let me down a wee bit, but in retrospect, it added a, a little bit of balance to life, if not to the fluid in my ears. And balance at every level is what it's all about. Once again, 
It's been great to hear a bit of the background to some of the big named anglers you met along the way. I did occasionally have dealings with, or even met some of them myself, though being a bit younger than you, and exiled up here in the northwest, not as many as I would have liked. But we all know a little bit more about them now. So many thanks then to Keith Sell for sharing those encounters with us here. 